You're listening to The Voluntary Life, where you can hear ideas for finding freedom in an unfree world. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to connect with the show and hear all past episodes. Here's your host, Jake. Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This episode is about entrepreneurship. I'm sharing a chapter from my book, Job Free. In the book, Job Free, I describe different strategies for achieving a job-free lifestyle on your own terms. And this chapter is about startups. This was my own journey towards financial independence was through founding, growing and selling a startup. And in this chapter, I describe some of the pros and cons of this kind of entrepreneurship. If you enjoy this chapter, then definitely check out the whole book, Job Free, which you can get in paperback, Kindle and audiobook format. And I'll put links to those in the show notes. And if you enjoy this, you'll also enjoy my book, Becoming an Entrepreneur, which goes into much more detail about my own experience of building a startup and the lessons that I learned in the process. Again, I'll put links to that book in the show notes too. So without further delay, here's a chapter from my book, Job Free. Chapter 4. Startups. If you want a happy ending, that depends, of course, on where you stop your story. Orson Welles Derek Sivers' Story Derek Sivers was a musician and circus clown. He wanted to sell his music as an independent musician, so he made a website called CD Baby to sell his CDs. Before long, other independent musicians came to him and asked him if he would sell their CDs through his website too. CD Baby grew to become the largest online independent music store in the world. Derek sold his business in 2008 for over $20 million. All the proceeds from the sale went into a charitable trust that he created, which gives him a 5% drawdown each year for the rest of his life. Upon his death, the trust will be used to support independent musicians. While he is alive, it provides him with an income. Derek now writes about entrepreneurship and has started various other businesses and fun projects that have meaning for him. His book, Anything You Want, describes the growth and sale of his business. He also has a blog where you can find out more about his approach to life. Startups as a Route to Job Freedom You can milk a business for income, but you can also build its capital value through growth. Ideally, you want to do both, but there is a trade-off between taking income and building the value of the business. If you had to focus, which would be your priority? If you prioritize getting income to support your preferred lifestyle, then you are building a lifestyle business, as discussed in the previous chapter. If you choose to focus on building the value of your business rather than milking it, then your model is a startup. The challenge of building a startup can provide a fulfilling job-free lifestyle. There is also a financial goal at the end of this challenge. The value of the business itself can ultimately provide you with the wealth to live from. If you succeed in selling your business for enough money, then you can live job-free from your investments. Although startups have a different focus to lifestyle businesses, a business can evolve from either one into the other. For example, a business can start out providing a lifestyle but evolve into a growth startup. Some people might prefer to own a lifestyle business for decades, whereas others might aim to sell a startup as quickly as possible. I've chosen to cover these two approaches to entrepreneurship separately because it is possible to focus exclusively on either approach. Is selling the business an integral part of a startup entrepreneur's plan? Some entrepreneurs argue, on the contrary, that if you want to start a business, you should do it without any intention to sell. As a business owner, you have a job-free life. You work for yourself. If you love working on your business, You may not want to sell because you are already doing what you most enjoy every day. However, it is possible to love your business and yet still aim to sell it one day. 
I loved running my pedestrian movement consulting business. Nonetheless, my aim from the beginning was to sell it when I could. One of my motivations for becoming an entrepreneur was that I wanted financial freedom. I wanted to do many things with my life, not just run one particular business. I saw the business as a major life project. I knew it was a commitment that would last for many years. But I also wanted to do something else afterward. Now that I've sold my business, I am writing, podcasting and traveling the world. Whatever your motivations, you will leave the business one day, one way or another. Nobody lives forever. Something is going to happen to your business when you are no longer able to exercise the responsibilities of owning it. Unless you go out of business involuntarily before then, there are only two ultimate fates for your company. Either your business will close down or it will carry on without you. If your business has value, then winding it down would be a senseless destruction of that value. But in order for the business to continue, somebody has to exercise the responsibilities of an owner. For that to happen, you have to successfully transfer ownership to someone else. I suggest every entrepreneur give due consideration to how they might sell in future. Like all things, your involvement in the business must end someday. Selling gives you the most positive ending. Homeowners are careful to maintain and upgrade their homes in awareness of future sale value. Similarly, having an eye towards a future business sale provides a great incentive for you as an entrepreneur to maintain and upgrade your business. It incentivizes you to make the business as valuable as possible and to minimize its dependence on you. It encourages you to implement the systems necessary to allow your operation to run without you. Best of all, you will create the conditions necessary so that one day, if you do it right, your business may give you the opportunity to quit the rat race. It will give you financial independence, which is a launch pad to do whatever you want with your life. What a great way to end your involvement in the business. How building and selling a startup works. The strategy for achieving financial independence by building and selling a startup can be summarized in five points. Number one. Start a scalable business, one that is capable of significant growth. Number two, grow the business to the size and profitability level that makes it sellable. Number three, find a buyer. Number four, negotiate a sale. Number five, invest the proceeds from your sale and live from your investments. Making a scalable business. In his book, Built to Sell, John Warrillow emphasizes the importance of specialization as a key to making a business scalable, which in turn will make it sellable. He recommends turning down unique or customized projects that do not contribute to the advancement of your standardized operation, even if you are previously dependent on such work for a large part of your revenue. If you want to sell your business, you have to stop doing generalist work. Instead, you must focus exclusively on work that is truly scalable, repeatable, and productized. How do you make your operation scalable? In the E-Myth Revisited, Michael Gerber put forward the idea that you should design your business as if it were a franchise prototype. Even if you never intend to set up a franchise chain, by designing your own business as if it were a franchise prototype, you create the procedures necessary for the business to run itself effectively and to allow for growth. Gerber recommends creating an operations manual that details procedures for specific tasks and designates clear responsibilities. Gerber's approach is about getting you, the entrepreneur, out of the day-to-day -day operations of the business so that the business can grow without you being a bottleneck. He describes this as working on your business rather than in your business. In Becoming an Entrepreneur, I describe my experience with extracting myself from operations in a chapter called Make Yourself Redundant. 
The ongoing iterative approach I suggest is threefold. Number one, standardize your product or service so that you are not reinventing the wheel each time you fulfill an order for a customer. Number two, proceduralize your operations so that all workflows are well-defined and can be easily repeated and controlled for quality. Number three, optimize your procedures using mechanization and automation to make them as efficient as you can. Growth and profitability. In almost all cases, selling is only viable if your business is both large enough and sufficiently profitable. Many small business owners want to sell their businesses before they've reached the right size or level of profitability. They just want to give up, get out of the business and get paid. That is not a compelling sales proposition. Let's address the issues of size and profitability in turn. Regarding size, your business must generate enough revenue to make buying it worthwhile for an acquirer. Most potential acquirers will not even look at your business if the revenue is too small. Below a certain level, no deal is worth the transaction cost to them. The legal and administrative costs of buying a business are more or less the same for a company worth a few hundred thousand dollars as they are for a company worth a few million. It is much easier to buy a bigger business because the transaction costs become a negligible fraction of the deal, whereas the deal costs alone can make buying a very small company unprofitable. I received this message myself when speaking to some potential buyers during the earlier stages of my business. Although they were interested in purchasing our consultancy, they had a minimum revenue threshold. As a matter of policy, they didn't consider any acquisitions below that threshold. There are always exceptional cases, companies with no revenue that sell for millions because they seem to promise great potential in the future. It is also possible to sell small companies, but often only for a price that will not give you the kind of payout needed for financial independence. In my opinion, any company with a revenue below about $3 million per year is going to be hard to sell owing to its small size. As well as size, your business must also generate a high profit margin in order to be sellable. Again, there are exceptions. Some internet startups sell for good money without ever having made a profit, but these are extremely unusual. The vast majority of business purchasers want to buy an income stream based on demonstrated profits. If you explore potential sales opportunities for your startup at a time when you're making good profits, you will have options for where to take the business. You can either sell or simply keep earning good money. You will have a strong negotiating position. I was not in any hurry to sell because I had a profitable business. I was able to walk away from negotiations until the terms were good enough. Finding a buyer. There are many ways to sell ownership, such as a trade sale, floating your business on the stock exchange, or selling to your employees in a management buyout. I sold my business through a trade sale, which is the most common route to selling a business. It is also the easiest way to sell, in my opinion. My comments in this chapter will focus on this route. The company acquiring your business needs to be big enough to be able to afford the purchase. If an acquirer has less than five times your revenue, buying your business becomes a bet the company decision. Should the acquisition fail to deliver on its promise, it would probably kill the acquiring company. No one will want to buy your business under those conditions. On the other hand, if a buyer's business is significantly bigger than yours, then purchasing your business might not make any appreciable difference to their financial performance. In such a case, it might not be worth the effort of undertaking the purchase. Warlow has suggested a 5 to 20 rule for acquisitions. The purchasing company tends to be between 5 and 20 times the size of the business that they are acquiring. You may be able to sell to a much bigger company if your business has a particular strategic value to a specific buyer. My business provided pedestrian movement simulation and analysis. 
The multinational engineering consultancy purchased us because they could utilize our specialist expertise on a great number of projects. Purchasing the business did virtually nothing for their end of year accounts because we were so tiny compared to them. Nonetheless, the acquisition gave them enough of a strategic advantage for the future to make the purchase worthwhile. They saw opportunities to add our services to many of the much larger projects that they were undertaking, thereby adding significant value to the client and improving their competitive position. Try to find a buyer who wants your business for more than just the impact that you will have on this year's financial statement. A strategic advantage of some kind is where the real value lies. It is important to develop relationships with potential buyers before you consider selling. I was able to sell my business because we had developed strong partnering relationships with many other companies that could potentially have been buyers of our business. Every time you work together with a bigger company in the same field, you're dealing with a potential buyer. If you develop good working relationships, then you build trust and potential buyers get to see the value you provide. That helps the negotiation because you're not starting from zero. You've already got something very valuable that the other party in the negotiation knows about. Buying a company is a difficult task that is fraught with risk. If you want someone to buy your business, make the decision easier for them by earning their trust. An effective way to do this is developing a working relationship with your potential buyer long before any discussion of a sale. Working together achieves two things. Firstly, it highlights the value of your offer because the acquiring company can see your business in action. Secondly, it gives you a platform to earn their trust by exhibiting your dependability in real working situations. As a specialist consultancy, we were often subcontracted by the big engineering company that eventually bought our business. They would add us into their projects to provide specialist expertise. Over a long period, we demonstrated that we added value to their projects. We developed a relationship of trust long before the sale. You may be able to develop partnering relationships with bigger complementary companies that might be potential acquirers. Partnering and affiliate relationships can help grow your business. They are also great ways to find potential acquirers. Like any type of sale, the sale of a business doesn't just happen. It requires planning and work. It requires you to understand the buyer's needs. You, as the seller, have to do the selling. You have to develop the value proposition. I spent over a year working on removing barriers to the sale of my business, on top of all the years spent growing it and making it more profitable. Negotiating a sale When you sell a business, you exchange your ownership for a multiple of expected future annual profit. The multiple used to determine the sale price depends very much on negotiation and varies from industry to industry. It comes down to how much profit you make and what multiple of that profit the buyer is willing to give you to get ownership of the business. So many issues can go wrong in a sale negotiation that I strongly recommend paying for a good advisor if you intend to sell. There are warranties, guarantees and insurance liabilities to consider. Will the acquiring company pay you in cash or in shares? Will some part of your payment depend on specific performance targets? What proportion of the total sum? I could have made big mistakes about all these important issues if I had not had good advice. We found an excellent advisor who had negotiated many previous business sales. He knew all the issues that tend to come up, so he was able to help us make informed decisions. A buyer will usually require you to stay on in the business for a period after the sale to help reach certain performance targets and ensure that the business keeps making money as it is supposed to. This earn-out period usually lasts a couple of years. I stayed on for three years after the sale of my business. Another aspect of the earn-out is how much of the money is going to be dependent on the performance of the business after the sale. In short, 
The buyer may want to set performance targets that you must meet following the sale in order to trigger the release of some fraction of the money. These are the kinds of issues that you need a good advisor to help you with during the negotiation. Living from investments. Like extreme savers, startup entrepreneurs aim for financial independence. However, their strategy for achieving it is different. Most extreme savers are employees who save the majority of their paycheck and gradually build up an investment portfolio over a period of about 10 years. They get incrementally closer to the point at which they can retire and live from their investment income. In contrast, entrepreneurs often deplete their personal savings to fund themselves during the startup phase, but those who sell their businesses get a big payout eventually. The process of growing your startup into a valuable asset is usually long and slow. However, when you sell the business, you realize the value of that asset all at once. If you sell for a sufficient price, it will put you in a similar position to the extreme savers. You will be able to live from your investments. Selling a startup is like extreme saving compressed into one payout. If you get a good enough price, You can invest the vast majority of your payout and live from the returns indefinitely. This can facilitate a zero hour work week whereby you live from truly passive investments. Entrepreneurs who sell their startups can pole vault their way to financial independence by gaining a big lump sum upon exit rather than by accumulating savings over a long period, as the intensive savers do. Successful entrepreneurs can get bigger payouts to retire from than extreme savers because a business has more growth potential than a salary income. On the other hand, most businesses never reach the point of a successful exit for the founder. I used all my personal savings and took out large debts to fund myself and my business during the first two years after startup. I then worked for seven years building the business and reaching profitability. My route to financial independence was the payout I received from selling the business. After the sale and the earnout period, startup entrepreneurs follow the same path as the intensive savers. You achieve financial independence when you have enough money saved that you can live from your investments sustainably. You'll hear more details about this in the appendix. If you can withdraw a safe amount each year from your passive investments, then you can do whatever you want with your time. Some people choose to start more businesses, as Derek Sivers did. The point is to have the freedom to do whatever you want. Things to consider about startups. If you are interested in building a startup, I suggest you consider how you will feel if you are never able to sell it. Very few businesses reach the size and profitability required for a successful exit. Financial independence is a great goal to aim for, but if you're only interested in your company as a vehicle to eventually sell, you probably won't enjoy a startup entrepreneur's life. Even if you make it to profitability, you may not be able to sell for years. The business cycle has a big effect on the willingness of companies to consider acquisitions. If the timing is bad, you may find it hard to find a buyer through no fault of your own. You may have to wait years until the broader economic conditions are favorable again. I was very lucky with the timing of my sale. I sold in 2007 during a time of relative economic optimism. The market for company acquisitions was much better before the crash of 2008 than afterwards. Such macroeconomic factors are outside your control. If you enjoy the adventure of entrepreneurship in itself, then it doesn't matter so much if you don't find a way to sell. Building a startup is already a job-free lifestyle. You get to be your own boss and spend every working day on the project that is most meaningful to you. If you can gain fulfillment from the startup lifestyle itself, then it is not the end of the world if you don't manage to sell. Even if you do have an opportunity to sell, It has downsides that are worth considering. Selling my business was one of the high points of my life so far, but it was also bittersweet. You cannot grow a business to profitability without pouring your heart and soul into it. 
What kept me going was my belief in the venture. I knew that we were doing great work. I felt a painful sense of loss when it was time to let go of my business. There is often a gulf between what the buyers of a business are buying and what the seller thinks they are selling. As a seller, you have spent years developing a company culture. Your procedures are not only the way that you do business, they are also the source of your efficiency and they represent your way of working. I viewed my company culture as extremely valuable. However, buyers have different priorities. Many buyers are not interested in buying a different company culture. They already have their own way of working that took years to develop. They are often most interested in purchasing the resources of a business to add to their own. In my case, the resources within my business were the software that we created and the people undertaking the analysis. I sold my business to a very large multinational consultancy that wanted my business to conform to their procedures. We had to move to their premises, use their IT systems, and become fully assimilated into their working culture. It was painful to watch them throwing away all the hard-won methods of working that I had developed for my company. I found it hard to see the new owners making decisions about my business that I would not have made. Part of selling a business is coming to terms with the sense of loss. Further resources on startups. If you would like to learn more about building a startup, here are some further resources that I recommend. Podcast episodes. You can find more discussion of the topics mentioned in this chapter in the following episodes of The Voluntary Life. Episode 53, Entrepreneurship Part 8, Selling Your Business. Episode 107, What Kind of Business Should I Start? Episode 121, The Big Decisions for Entrepreneurs. Episode 161, Review of Built to Sell by John Warrillow. Episode 207, Who Will Buy Your Business? Books. My book, Becoming an Entrepreneur, provides an overview of the process of building a startup and is a good place to start. The Lean Startup by Eric Ries is a helpful manual for startup entrepreneurs covering more technical details. The Art of the Start by Guy Kawasaki is also good as a general introduction. Derek Sivers' book, Anything You Want, is a fascinating account of the process of selling a business. There are two key books on the process of selling. Built to Sell by John Warrillow is a useful how-to guide for the whole process of building and selling a startup. Finish Big by Bo Burlingham has many interviews with entrepreneurs who sold and contains a more detailed discussion of technical topics such as valuation. Three general entrepreneurship books that I previously mentioned for lifestyle businesses are also relevant for startups. The E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber, Rework by Jason Fried and David Heinemeyer Hansen, and Harry Brown's book, How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World. The appendix of this audiobook also has more resources on the investment side of selling a startup as a route to financial independence. Thank you for listening to The Voluntary Life. If you like this podcast, please show your support by becoming a patron of The Voluntary Life on Patreon. Your support will help to grow and improve the show, and you'll get access to a treasure trove of rewards, including bonus episodes. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to learn more.